Hi, everyone, and welcome to the main tag. Thanks for being with us on this beautiful Tuesday following a special Patriots Day holiday. My name is Dana Connors. I'm pleased to be your host for this weekly program now airing on Tuesdays at noon, not as it previously was on Mondays at three o'clock. We made that change based upon the recommendations of our viewers and we're happy to oblige. But the program may have changed in time, but it has not changed in focus. We still take a look at those people, those initiatives making a difference in, in our state. They're working to improve our lives, our livelihood, growing Maine's economy. And today's program does just that. We're gonna focus on Earth Day. We'll have two members of the Climate Council to talk with us about the Climate Action Plan. We'll follow that with a very special person who has something very meaningful in terms of allowing us to evaluate progress. It's a climate change solution stimulator. We'll follow that with a special guest that appears with us every week to talk about what's new, what's happening in Maine Biz. That'll be followed by our advocacy team as usual, and we'll wrap it up with kind of a summary of today's program. So let us begin. It's Earth Day, a special day. And every year since 1970, on April the 22nd, we are asked to set aside time during that day, which happens to be Thursday of this week, to honor the anniversary of the modern environmental movement. And today, as I mentioned, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna, we're gonna help to celebrate or at least to understand by discussing our state's climate action plan. And that's where we begin. This was a plan that, re that was released in December of this past year, 2020. It was a plan that brought a lot of people together from diverse backgrounds with strong opinions. And after 14 months, they came to a conclusion, a consensus conclusion as to how we should go about combating climate change. They took on that challenge and we're about to share with you what that report contained. Let me begin by introducing our two very special guests. Our first is the commissioner of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection who happens to co-chair the Climate Council. Melanie Loisom is that person. She's been with the department since 2006. She's taken on a number of responsibilities there, including bureau directors, deputy commissioner, as well as currently commissioner. The other guest who also served on the Climate Council and chaired one of the very vital subcommittees is Matt Marks. Matt is the CEO of the Associated General Con Contractors of Maine, and he's been in that position since 2012. Prior to that, he was a chief operating officer for that same organization. Both were instrumental in bringing this report to bear, to guide us going forward. And it's my pleasure to welcome both of them. And thank you both for being with us today. Commissioner, let's begin. I think that while climate change has had a considerable debate over the years, I think here in Maine, we know that climate change is real. We also know that Maine can't wait. We want to get about the task. And in that respect, the governor brought together 39 people, uh, scientists, advocates, professionals, if you will, all with strong opinions and ideas as to how to go about meeting this challenge. And in the course of 14 months, as I recall, they were able to do that. They were able to reach consensus. There is a plan of action. It's called the climate, the yeah, the climate change action plan. You know, and, and I, I I marvel at the fact that it was an ambitious goal that was established by your council to reduce carbon emissions by 45% in 2030 and 80% by 2050 with carbon neutrality accomplished by 2045. You know, the fact that you were able to bring all those people together and come at this very significant goal in and of itself speaks volumes, both the need as well as the ability to work together. And I'm sure to use science and data as opposed to opinion to reach that conclusion. 
So let me begin, because time is limited, let me begin by asking you right up front if now that we have that plan and the goal is well established, what is probably the most significant first step that can be undertaken that shows progress, that gets people's attention and gets us on the move? What would that be? Uh, well, thank you, Dana, for that question and uh, the great introduction to the work that the Maine Climate Council did. Um, I would say that we do definitely use science to help drive the policy goals um, and the larger economic goals that were set by the climate plan. And we know from looking at our greenhouse gas emissions inventory that more than 50 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions that are released in the state of Maine come from our transportation sector. Uh, so one of the major challenges in front of us in a rural state uh, where before COVID we had many people that were commuting to work every day was to find ways to reduce transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have some very aggressive goals for a number of electric vehicles to be sold in the state as one of the um, major ways for us to tackle those emissions is to get off of fossil fuel as the way that we move ourselves around the state. Speaking of getting off in fossil fuels, I'm, I'm curious in terms of, I'm assuming that renewable energy sources play a very significant role also in terms of meeting this goal. Can you touch upon that? Absolutely, they do. Um, it's a very important part of the overall framework. We have to get the electricity from somewhere. Um, renewable sources like solar projects, wind, hydroelectric power are going to be enormously important for replacing some of our fossil fuel based electrical generation in the region that we've been reliant on. Um, it would also be remiss not to note that for our heavier duty vehicle fleets, you know, electrification is not a really affordable option or even technologically available yet in many cases. We hope that uh, technology will advance there. Um, but we can also look at alternative fuel sources like biofuel, biodiesel, even landfill gas and gas from anaerobic digesters as another way to offset fossil fuel combustion with uh, energy that we can develop right here in Maine. Yeah, before I turn it to Matt for a couple of questions, I wanted to ask you uh, two things. For the viewer that may be watching, or we hope they're watching, that uh, Carbon neutrality by 2045, as it compares to the others, is that just a balance between what's emitted and what's reduced? Is that what, in terms of carbon? Uh, it's a balance between the carbon that's admitted into the atmosphere and the carbon that we estimate that is absorbed from the atmosphere through things like tree growth, for instance. Um, through soil management, the carbon can be sequestered in our soils. It can also be sequestered in our coastal wetlands. We refer to that as blue carbon, for example. Yeah. Um, so there are many resources in the state that help us to remove carbon from the atmosphere. When I look at the plan and have reviewed it, it's a four-year plan to reduce uh, carbon emissions into our into our air, um, but the goal is to go out much further into 2030, 2050, 2045. What is the significance of the four year definition? Um, so before the most recent law was passed establishing the Maine Climate Council, we already had a biennial requirement to uh, do a statewide inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. And so it built on that existing structure. Uh, the four-year planning cycle then enables us to take into account uh, intermediate step. So in two years, we'll have uh, updated greenhouse gas emission inventory that will help us track our progress in implementing the plan and then help inform the work that we'll do in developing the next four-year plan. So we have these two-year cycles with data to help inform the four-year planning cycle. Uh, that's that's uh, very helpful. Matt, let's turn our attention to you for a moment. Matt, you sat on a very um, meaningful, important subcommittee. As a matter of fact, when I read about the process that had I, I guess it's fair to say 39 climate council members, but several hundred who participated in the process, which makes the results even more 
um, incredible, if you will. But you sit on a place where you can relate to what I'm about to say, that so often you seldom see where the environment and the economy kind of work hand in glove. It's usually put forth as if the economy wins, the environment does not, or if the environment wins, the economy. In other words, they're at, they are at, at odds, but not in this case. I mean, it seems to me that that there's a real emphasis on the economy, on jobs. And I think of it in, in this way, the green economy. Can you, can you speak to that and how this does uh, help the economy? Absolutely, thank you, Dana. Uh, the members of the State Chamber, I appreciate uh, the chance to speak today. Uh, you're right, uh, this was not simple, it was complicated. I, I wanna thank the commissioner for wrangling uh, all 100 of us on various <laughs> committees over 14 months. That wasn't easy, I know that. Uh, a lot of opinions, but a lot of, uh, a lot of us learned uh, on both sides uh, of the issue here. And I, I could say the reason we came together was we, we kept working at it. Um, there was a, a time period there where we broke into several subgroups and uh, started to analyze the different components of it. And it was a proud moment to be able to bring that information back and see it sort of develop. From a jobs perspective, uh, one thing that's beneficial is that uh, during the last Great Recession, shortly after 2009, uh, Maine had uh, invested or developers had invested a significant amount of money here in Maine in wind energy. And so we had a, a, a very uh, growth, a very nice growth period in the energy sector when uh, the rest of the economy was struggling. And what that did was introduce uh, the clean energy market to uh, contractors in a way that we had never seen before. And not only did it help uh, introduce uh, new investments into transmission delivery, but they gained a lot of knowledgeable experience uh, building those structures too. So out of this, uh, we, we, we really took a positive approach to see what uh, parts of a clean energy economy contractors could play. And uh, it turns out that uh, there's a significant amount of job opportunities here. And they're, they're very good, good jobs. They're good careers uh, that can last a long time. Those skills can transfer over. So we were, we were very positive about the outcome of uh, solar, uh, wind, uh, you know, even the energy uh, that has to be put into the development and design of uh, electrification of uh, cars and vehicles. All that stuff is uh, construction design related. And as you know, as a former commissioner, uh, that provides a ton of jobs. Yeah, one of the things that uh, it's probably not a fair question, but when you think of your responsibilities, uh, the general contractors and their meaning in terms of our state, and as positive as electric vehicles can be and alternative fuels are um, to our state's economy and particularly to this issue, as commissioner, I would be worrying about the loss of revenue and the need to offset that loss of revenue in other ways. Was that ever a topic or an item of discussion within your subcommittee? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, and there has been a lot of discussion with the Blue Ribbon Commission to look at funding for transportation. It's uh, it's going to take some time as we start to, you know, transfer to a, a different way of getting from A to Z. Uh, there will be impacts, and there will have to be adjustments. But overall, when we looked at the goal. Uh, we recognize that this is more of an opportunity than it is a detriment. So, um, you know, taking that approach, you can always turn something into a, a good thing for all. And I think in this case, you know, the contracting community has adapted a lot over the years and, and um, nothing will change about this as we move forward. I mean, I think we're going to continue to find ways to uh, help build the clean energy economy. Well, and, and to back up what you just said, I mean, <clears throat> the very example that this effort has brought forward is an example for all of us that when you do have sometimes conflicting or in the mind's eye a conflicting issues that you have proven that by coming together and working together, you can satisfy both of those if you're willing to reach that balance. And I think that's exactly what has been happened has happened here. What from your point of view, what do you think was the key? I'm I'm constantly impressed with the fact that you could take several hundred opinions and ideas. You could put them before scientists, advocates, professionals, and reach consensus. What do you think the key to that was? That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Uh, you know, I, I'll, the commissioner certainly, um, you know, and her, the, the team they put together to organize it was really uh, what facilitated this. We had professional facilitators that helped take ideas. 
Uh, we vetted those. Uh, when we didn't understand something, the nice part was we were able to bring in experts to explain it. Uh, of course, you know, from a construction design engineering perspective, we felt like we had that covered, but we learned a lot about our, our natural environment that, you know, I certainly didn't know going in. And uh, I would say that that was a huge assistance to all the decision makers. Uh, the ability to have those really frank discussions uh, made a difference for us. And I'm sure the commissioner probably saw a lot of that happening in some of the other subcommittees too. Oh, that's, uh, that's very well said. Uh, it's amazing how quickly time flies. I wish we had more time, but we'll, uh, we'll get back to you because this is an issue that unites our state, both in terms of the environment and the economy. And I'd ask this as the last question, which is if, you, if somebody wanted to get more information about what's in the report, I know you've put out a report that's available to people, but is there a website? Is there information that people can go to to get the information uh, beyond what you've discussed today? Sure, if you just, um, and not to put in a plug for Google, but if you Google Maine Climate Council, uh, it will take you right to their webpage. Uh, if you look at the first, the list of options on the left, uh, there's a, a link for all of the reports. It includes uh, a lot of the science that was the basis for the plan itself, the information that uh, Matt was referring to that was presented to the council um, from the science and technical subcommittee report, as well as the report on um, what if we do nothing, the cost of inaction is there as well. Also results from the modeling that was done to help us determine which strategies would get to those ultimate greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Great. Well, my hat's off to both of you and to all members of the Climate Council for putting together something that the state values, state needs, and most of all, that it recognizes the value of both the environment, but also our economy. Thanks to you both. Now let me turn my attention to uh, another subject within the climate change challenge. Have you ever wondered, based upon what we've just heard here today, that there are many alternatives that can help us reach that goal. There are policies before us that help in the same way. But is there something out there that can really look at climate action, can help us measure those uh, alternatives and be able to relate to the significance of reduction in greenhouse gases? Well, our next guest is gonna talk about that and help us answer the question. Peter Dugas is the person, and if you read Sunday's paper, you would know that his distinction in looking after our planet is pretty much his goal in life, whether you're at the state level or the national level. And he's here to talk to us about that, but he also, in Sunday's paper, was recognized as one of five people who were honored by receiving the 2021 Source Main Sustainability Award. These go to outstanding people who contribute to the state's environmental well-being. Peter, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and we are all anxious to have you talk to us, to share with us the significance of what En-ROADS, E-N-R-O-A-D-S, what is its function and what about this climate change solution stimulator? And how does that help? Thank you so much, Dana. I'm really, really happy to be on there. And I'm, I'm humbled to be on right after Matt and Melanie um, and lauds uh, to their uh, great work within the Maine Climate Council. Um, it's true, Maine, Maine can't wait. And we uh, are very fortunate to have their leadership. Um, but to answer your question, um, the En-ROADS, uh, Climate Simulator is a product of the Sloan School of Management. MIT Sloan School of Management has a nonprofit wing dedicated towards climate education and research um, called Climate Interactive. And they are, have open access. It's a very sophisticated tool that they've developed um, about a year and a half ago. It was released a little bit less, um, which is uh, actually an economics based model that shows different uh, outcomes for our different um, ideas that we would have to, to try to mitigate the climate crisis. Um, and it's driven from a, from, a, uh, from a policy standpoint, from an economic policy standpoint. There's a couple caveats to it. One, um, 
not it's a global model so one has to be very careful that this doesn't don't draw too many conclusions about the great work happening in the state of maine not the reason some of the outcomes might look like they do is because we're not all not everyone is as blessed to live in a state like maine with such rich renewable uh, energy infrastructure already and uh, and growing leadership in that area but um but it does help to kind of get an idea about if we were to extrapolate the ideas we're coming up with Maine towards the country and even the whole world, we could see what that result would be. That's great. Uh, you're, a, you're a Portland guy and you work with a number of other individuals in bringing this to the attention of actually the nation or at the congressional level, but here in the state of Maine, and we commend you for that. But you're also part of a group, uh, like I said, can you speak a bit about the effort behind that? Sure. Yeah, I'm wearing two hats. One is um, I've gone through the accreditation through the MIT training for, for the En-ROAD simulator. Um, but I also use it uh, mostly as an educational tool for um, what's a, a volunteer group that's got about 200,000 uh, 200, volunteers across the state called Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a bipartisan grassroots volunteer led group working with directly creating relation, cultivating relationships with our national lawmakers to build a national bipartisan solution um, for uh, that's to the, to the scale and scope of the, of the, the national crisis. Um, we have cultivated over the past 15 years, great relationships with our leaders and the main chapter of this group with our 2000 members actually is pivotally important. We, we punch uh, outside of our weight because um, we have, we're the only state out of the 50 in the nation that has both of our senators on the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, we also have a good relationship um, uh, creating, uh, bringing some of the, the national ideas that, that are bipartisan to try to bring uh, this into scope and to, to mitigate the effects of climate change. Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> Going back to this stimulator, simulator, um, you know, as many efforts as many of us have been involved in over the years that have significant ambitious goals like the Climate Action Plan has, that it's often difficult to measure which alternatives work the best and are we getting there? How, how is progress going? And I find that this instrument, if I, as I would call it that, it, or modeling, really does help guide us in that respect, in both respects. Yeah. Yeah, and let, let me jump into it if I might share my screen and we can take a look yeah, at it together please. if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So this is what it looks like. We're looking here at 20 years of history and 80 years into the future for um, where global energy sources are coming from. The red line is oil, black is uh, or coal, blue is natural gas, renewables, thankfully, are rising through the through the, uh, the next decades. Bioenergy is pink, nuclear hugs the bottom here and, and net zero would be on the bottom. Uh, net zero is kind of like a catch-all in case we come with, a, with nuclear fusion or something we're not anticipating. Vibranium, if you've seen any like sci-fi movies or something. And then the temperature change here is what we've seen since 20 years ago, we were at about 0.83 degrees centigrade above the industrial levels. Now we're up at around 1.3. And then these dashed lines are what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN, the leading scientific thinkers on the field say, we need to stay below in order to avoid humanitarian catastrophe. But, um, and you can see that we, uh, at first they said 1.5 degrees and they said, well, maybe we'll be okay at two degrees. So you can see we're on a bad trajectory with business as usual. But the model shows of responsiveness to different ideas on a global level. Um, I might point out, so some of the things we can talk about, you know, this, I'm only giving you the scratching the surface. You can click here and see a number of different things that the model will show. Um, and we can actually look into assumptions and everything. But for just the Reader's Digest, back of the envelope thing, we can talk about perhaps planting a trillion trees, which has been talked about a lot, which is everything is a good step in the right direction. Um, but the, a lot of this has to do with, if I move this slider all the way over and simulate that, you can see that that expected temperature increase goes down by a 10th of a degree centigrade, which is a step in the right direction. 
However, it's very difficult to get to that two degrees with any, well, it's impossible with any ones, but we're kind of, there's no silver bullet here. There's only silver buckshot. Um, we could talk about, um, let's see, we could talk about on a, on a global scale, having a, a national or a, uh, international treaty perhaps where we will ban the construction of new coal plants. And that's, it gets us down to quite a bit. Again, doesn't get us all the way to where we need to be, but just showing you some highlights. Um, Dane, if you had something you'd like to offer, I could I could simulate it for you as well. No, no, keep going. I, I find this fascinating. Yeah. yeah, one of the things, and this is, again, this is the part where um, Matt and Melanie know a lot more about Maine's particular um, energy um, uh, portfolio, where we're getting our energy from. But because most of the world is still getting a lot of its fuel from dirty sources, if I grab electrification of vehicles and move that all the way over, you can see that it. The problem is, as although renewables goes up and oil price and oil consumption goes down, the response is that coal will also go up. So we need to have a combination, of course, on a global scale. And for me, it'll be a lot different because we have no coal. But for on a global scale, remember uh, when Australia was experiencing record wildfires a year ago, its number one export was still coal. So we have to be worried about that. The most plentiful and the dirtiest of fossil fuels. Um, I'll go through a couple of other things, even renewables, which is another, it was wonderful to see these go up. Now I'm not waving a magic wand by moving this slider over. I'm actually giving incentives. You can see it says highly subsidized or highly incentivized to switch to renewables. We love seeing that carbon neutral energy source going way, way up. But because we're not addressing the uh, disincentivizing uh, dirty coal or oil or other products, um, you can see that this doesn't deviate till much later in the century. We actually are, we can see there's an economic feed uh, rebound effect where coal will go down mid-century because suddenly it's become much cheaper to switch to renewables because of incentives, but it'll have a rebound effect later on. Um, just so that I, I will say that this is going to be very sobering to work with. I encourage any of the listeners to, to play with it. And But I'll leave you with one thing that's exciting is that one of the groups, uh, one of the things that we're very excited about within the group, the other uh, volunteer organization, Citizens Climate Lobby, is that we have um, been re just recently, um, we have the reintroduction of the what's called the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, which is a national carbon fee and dividend policy, which is actually puts a gradually increasing price on carbon that goes up through the, the um, through the next 80 years, starting this year, we'll say, and it's, it's uh, Representative Pingree has been, been a co-sponsor, and we know that Senator Collins has spoken highly of. Uh, uh, she's actually introduced a similar bill a dozen years ago, um, which goes up every year by 10 bucks a year. So you can see this gradually increase in carbon, and that does more than you know double, three, three times, or even quadruple most any other uh, policy. And from there, we can. Now, you know, once we have a, a gradual increase in price on carbon, that does two, it, it incentivizes the clean fuel and disincentivizes dirty fuel at the same stroke and it works economy wide. There's, effect, you know, there's equitable uh, questions about what to do with that money once it comes in. And one of the reasons why it's gained um, the support from the business round table and um, has been spoken highly of by uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as a market-based solution is that it, it takes all of that revenue and returns it as an equal uh, dividend, a monthly dividend check to each uh, man, woman, and, and child. And it actually creates um, a positive feedback loop where we're basically bringing the economic externality into the system, uh, which I can show you here actually greatly benefits the, uh, the lowest income levels and everybody up until about 60, 70 percentile uh, income level um, will break even or, or do better. And, uh, and the top 30 percent, it's like less than 2 percent change. And they're the ones who can afford to actually decarbonize their lifestyles a lot better. Um, wow. Yeah. Very fascinating, very impressive. Um, little wonder you received that very distinguished and special award and hats off to you and all the others in Maine that put us in the forefront of this in innovative type of initiative that you're a part of. Thank you for that. And thank you for being on the show. It's, uh, it, it's great work and we deeply appreciate it. Maine is very fortunate.
and you're one of the reasons why. So Thank thanks. you, Dana. Thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure. Um, now let's switch our attention to our regular uh, Peter Van Allen, who's with us every week, who also brings good news, positive news, and we're anxious once again to hear about it. Peter is the editor of Maine Biz, um, and we very much enjoy having him on our program each and every week. Peter? Dana, thanks so much, and thanks as always for, for having me on. You know, what I was going to talk about today is not that far afield from what, what you have been talking about in this class at, or in this uh, uh, program. I was going to bring up the Rue Institute and kind of the progress over the last couple of years at this Portland institution. So just uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, Northeastern University came to, the, came to Maine two years ago and they wanted to set up an, uh, a, a, a part of its graduate school where, where students could be trained in technology and life sciences. And the key, key, you know, some of the key things that helped it along the way received $100 million from David and Barbara Rue. He was, mm -hmm. he was a Lewiston native who had a lot of experience in the tech and life sciences industry. And then more recently, it got $100 million from the Harold Alfon Foundation. So it's, it's well capitalized. They're leasing, subleasing space from WEX in Portland's eastern, eastern um, waterfront. So in addition to the life sciences and tech jobs, which we're already, we already have a base here with IDEX, uh, Emucel, Abbott Labs has a big operation here, Covetris, and you know, WEX is, you could say it's a financial services company, but they have a lot of technology aspects to it. Um, but another element of what the Rue Institute wants to do is be an incubator for startups. And to that end, today they announced that they had hired uh, someone to come in and run what they call the Techstars Accelerator. Uh, so this guy, Lars uh, Perkins, is based in Los Angeles now. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if he's going to be bi-coastal, if he's going to base himself in Portland, but uh, for now he's in Los Angeles. He's the creator of Picasso, which was a digital photography program that eventually sold to Google. He went to work at Google. Um, and he has subsequently been at the sort of the foundation of a lot of startups and, uh, and has been, you know, been at sort of the forefront of this uh, the technology startup world. Uh, so that, you know, in the progress that they've, that they've been, that they've made at the Rue Institute, it felt like a big step, you know, kind of bringing in somebody who could really oversee this and, and hopefully, you know, kind of generate some more interest in the startup community here in Maine. Oh, that's uh, extremely positive. And yes, we are very fortunate that they chose Maine to, to be a part of our future, a very significant investment for our people, but also for our economy. Peter, it's always a pleasure having you on because you always bring great news. And uh, I hope that the more you witness, more people that see a program like today can understand why we think so highly of Maine, its promise, as well as his future, both in terms of the people, but also their ideas. And today have been reinforcing to that point. So thank you for bringing us a very positive message. Look forward to seeing you back here next Tuesday. Thank you, Dan. Another great story. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> now let's turn our attention and the time remaining. Um, two of our advocate team are with us today. One uh, is with his family on vacation while his kids are out of school. And Peter Gore, who is ex our executive VP that oversees the human resource part of our uh, chamber. And Linda Caprera, who is also a senior specialist, is, oversees our taxation. And so in the interest of time, pick an issue that you believe that is on the docket, in play, that our viewing public should know about. Peter? Sure thing, Dana. Um, the Labor Committee, Labor and Housing Committee, has a lot on their plate this week, but tomorrow they'll take up a number of different bills in work session. Probably the one that we're following, we're following all of them closely, but 225 is the bill that will require employers who offer vacation time to cash it out when an employee mm -hmm. leaves. Um, it's a bill that we have great concern about. It adds a lot to employers that currently don't do that. Some employers choose to, and that's what the law says that if you choose to do it, it takes the same status as wages earned, but this takes it to the next level and would require all employers who offer paid vacation time to cash that out. 
Um, the committee will take it up tomorrow. They have uh, an amendment um, they plan to introduce. Doesn't really improve the bill from the perspective of the business community. We would remain opposed and we'll be seeing what happens to that when the legislature comes back at the end of the month and debates it. Linda, what's your issue? My issue is LD 1337. This is the bill that um, basically would impose a vacancy impact fee on Maine second, home, um, second homes in Maine. Um, you know, three out of four homes in Maine are owned by, second homes are owned by Mainers. Um, so this is huge. It's a 0.5% uh, fee. And basically it would apply if the house was vacant for less than 180 days um, or you can't prove it's not habitable for, for three months or less. So that's really, this, is, this goes to the heart of Mainers. <laughs> they own second homes. They pride themselves on, on that. They get away for a few days. Now they're gonna be taxed on, on these homes. Um, so you, know, you hear it, does, it won't apply to camps, but that's not true. Um, so uh, we're watching that very closely. And there's just one more bill I wanna um, mention very quickly. It's LD 1514, and this would um, basically impose an asset tax of 0.5% on all financial assets over $5 million. Uh, this includes uh, CD stocks, mutual funds, um, you know, any type of financial assets. Uh, we're looking at this very closely and trying to decipher some of the um, provisions in here, but we think it applies to even businesses and, and across the board over $5 million. So very troubling bills. Yeah, and those are just two, but I guess we could say three bills that are in play uh, amongst countless others. I appreciate you taking the time to share with our viewers what concerns you, and um, hopefully uh, they'll take it to heart and we can deal with them in the right, the right way. And I think we all know what that is. So thanks. Thanks to both of you. You know, it's been a very positive program in my opinion and has been I'm very grateful that the state chamber could bring it to you today on the main take. You know more than anything else it reminds me um, when I used to travel when the pandemic wasn't a part of our life uh, when I used to travel not just in the state but out of the state and and people would ask me Dana what, what would you say the state's brand is? And while it's not captured anywhere specifically, my answer was always the same. It was, it can be captured in one word. That one word is quality. Quality of people, quality of products, but also quality of place. It's really a statement about how our people are. They care for one another. Their work ethic is second to none. Uh, they are community-minded, very special people. It's also about the economy and the environment. It's where the economy and the environment are priorities. That's the way it is in our state, and we just heard about it today. It's a state where both are needed to be appreciated, to be able to achieve the brand that we have, but also the success that we enjoy. Today, we heard about a four-year plan for climate action. And that's exactly what I just spoke about when I spoke about the brand. Because they were able in 14 months to bring together 39 scientists, experts, advocates, all with opinions. And then they solicit help from hundreds of other people. And the end of it, not only did they come together at the call of the governor, they stayed together, they worked together, they used data and science, they listened, they debated, all of that to overcome simply opinions. And in the process, they reached consensus. We talked about what that was, that the carbon emissions would be reduced by 45% in 2030, 80% in 2050, and carbon neutrality, as we heard the commissioner describe it, by 2000 and 45. In the process, they created a new expanded economic sector. The governor's plan was to add 30,000 as a result of this green economy by 2030, I believe. It wasn't the case where one was at the loss of the other. Our environment will benefit, our economy will benefit. 
And on a slightly lighter note, while I was thinking about that and sharing those thoughts with you, an old sitcom came to mind. When I say old sitcom, because it certainly was, my two sons are 53 and 50 today. Uh, and this was a program back probably in the early, mid 80s. It was called the A-Team. And it was a group of people that came together from diverse places in their life. And they were facing together a major challenge, trying to turn it into an opportunity. And believe it or not, at the end of that half hour, they did. And the captain would always say, you know, I love it when a plan comes together. Well, I'll put the members of the Climate Council and all of us in Maine, when we stop to think about it, should be saying the same thing. We love it that the Climate Action Plan has come together. Yes, the Climate Action Plan, the way it, was, the way it came together, the effort involved was a wonderful accomplishment and one that honors and pays tribute to that special day on Thursday, Earth Day. I can remember as a city manager when I first experienced the celebration of that day, the words that one of the speakers said is that the earth is what we all have in common. It's our responsibility to protect it, preserve it. And that's what Earth Day is all about. And that's what you heard today in terms of our guest speaking to that very point. So take a moment on Thursday to familiarize yourself with the Climate Action Plan, to recognize it for the opportunity it presents for a better sustainable future. I think we all have a responsibility to take that time to do it, both you and I. Maine can't wait. As a matter of fact, this, pro this particular initiative, Maine Climate Action Plan, says that Maine won't wait. <laughs> I thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to seeing you right back here next Tuesday at noontime. In the meantime, have a great week. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to our special guests. And thanks to all of you for once again being our viewer audience. Please take care of yourself and please take care of one another.